Hello, everyone. Today we're focusing on work on in the economy, and there will be a few things uh, that we talked about with COVID-19, as we know that's affected us a lot. Um, when we talk about the current nature of work and the changing nature of work, we continue to uh, play off of our history in the Industrial Revolution. There obviously is pre-industrial revolution, farming ecology, agricultural uh, way of life. But when we continually think about our current system, the industrial revolution is the pinnacle of um, how our current work is set. It was an economic shift then from agricultural industry that occurred between 18th and early 19th century that moved us from family production and more mechanical ways of living in life, for example, rural communities or smaller communities who had high levels of roles where people specialized and they knew their role in doing one major thing very well or having a few for some competition, but not a lot, um, where we moved to market production where capitalist owners paid workers wages to produce goods on a larger manufacturing scale. After 1960s, we started to see the entrance of the service revolution with the US economy shifting from a manufacturing service based economy based on dominating um, the com combination of both manufacturing and moving into what's called service industry. The way I look at this is when I was younger, I will never forget starting to see more and more restaurants show up um, and how we are so used to these days having chains like Olive Garden. Applebee's, um, all of these different chains. Well, now those chains are going away and people are getting more into more specialized um, types of uh, non-chain food places, but then even the chain food places have to have a certain um, atmosphere. That's kind of how that service revolution works is um, taking things that we usually did in our home. I ate at home a lot more as a kid and um, the ability to just go get fast food was something we did maybe once or twice uh, a month, not necessarily even a week. So seeing that service revolution happen with our haircuts, happen with our care of our body, our care of our kids, um, anything that we, we need, we can take care of with somebody doing that nature of work. The other thing we saw change after uh, the 1970s, as we started to globalize, we'll talk a little bit more about globalization later, the industrialization started to take place. My dad's a truck driver um, and was part of a system where trucking even was uh, taken down for quite a while and now it's kind of kicked back up again. But uh, when you see that kind of industry, which is almost a service industry versus a person working in airplane uh, production or automobile industry, where a large portion of that work has been outsourced uh, to other parts and regions of the world, then what happened is we have a lot of these. This is actually a picture of, you know, a Detroit plant. Um, I think, you know, you can go around Detroit and see many places like this now uh, where that manufacturing uh, was lost in the 2000s. And we lost 33% of those jobs in the 2000s. Lost manufacturing jobs are re replaced then often by unstable, low paying service jobs or no jobs at all. And that has been a major debate in their political atmosphere. Women in the workforce, again, is another phrase I really don't like. Um, because honestly, women, men, all have had labor or work. What does it mean to work? What does it mean to labor? We all work and we know we can go into domestic work and we can go into all of those things that we've talked about previously in families. But we also have to recognize that we see this picture to the left that kind of is women in pantsuits taking on managerial jo jobs. But women have been part of the workforce since the get-go. And we often forget, and again, whitewash this, that immigrants and people of color and um, people who have been at lower socioeconomic levels have always been working. And women have always been in the workforce. But as a system that counts them in the workforce, we have not counted them per se until after World War II as having much value. Women began entering the quote unquote workforce in large numbers after World War II, but many were also then forced back into lower paying jobs after the war and the conclusion of the war. Yet ERA movements and others uh, 
like Gloria Steinem, um, Audrey Lord, others that got out there and said, no, this is not something that you can just force us in and out of a system. If we want to work, we want to have the ability to do that. That labor force participation rate then has steadily increased and in 2000, for the first time in the US history, women outnumbered men in the workplace, non-farm jobs, but we also need to recognize that they are not making the same amount as they are making 78 cents to the dollar of a male worker. Women in the workforce also means that elderly are in the workforce, especially elderly women. Um, we know that persons over certain ages are living longer um, and so we see our retirement age being questioned because at age 65, when many are forced to retire, um, they are not able to sustain their lives for another 20 years on that retirement. And so we see this image of older people that are in our grocery stores and on our lower pay paying jobs supplementing uh, their social security or pension if they got something. Foreign born immigrant workers has also been part of our workforce even though people think of it as a new thing, all workers in the United States have been at one point foreign born or immigrant uh, related, unless they were Native American. For 2016, there were 27 million foreign born workers in the United States. They were employed in service occupations and are less likely than US born workers to be in management, professional sales or office occupations. I again question this as it changes over time. Uh, my work is working with foreign born pastors and their major role in religion and uh, leadership. But we also see in areas where urbanization has kind of forced younger people out of their communities that more uh, foreign born professionals like dentists, doctors, um, people who are um, in that management professional level are prominent in communities. So uh, if you take my rural sociology class, we're going to look at that a little bit more. That's this summer if you want to take that. Among foreign born workers, 43.6% lived in the West and Northeast. They tend to settle in areas where they're perceived economic opportunities, but I often say it's also support systems and where their families are connected. We have to recognize pandemics like COVID-19 do take a toll on all of the labor levels, um, but specifically for people who are um, in lower class status and have lower skilled jobs. Um, and at the same time, we do recognize that many of those who we listed uh, previously in this lecture are the ones that we are uh, relying on in food service, for example, or uh, people who are caring for the elderly in nursing homes or our uh, workers in hospitals. So we have to recognize that there is a sense of our reliance, whether or not they get paid equally um, on many of these folks and that their value is great. Yet we also see that there is a major toll sometimes that's taken out on an economy by a pandemic such as this. This newest statistic, which came out just yesterday, is that total non-farm payroll employment fell by 701,000 in March and the un unemployment rate rose to 4.4%. These changes do reflect COVID-19. Employment and leisure and hospitality fell sharply with smaller job loss losses in other industries and the employed service occupations and are less likely than US born to work in management professionals. Oh, that was my other piece there too, <laughs> sorry. But those who are employed um, in these service occupations, which I was just talking about earlier, are the ones that are probably taking the largest hit. Let's look at the theories. First, functionalists will say that the function of work and labor is tri you know, multifaceted. There's uh, so many ways in which our work defines us and who we are, even though we don't necessarily enjoy that labeling. It provides us with predictability about the experience we're supposed to expect. For example, it helps determine when we get married, have children, or buy a home. That's been the previous idea of functionalists that there was a set uh, way of doing that. Of course, there's much challenge to that as younger generations may not even marry, may not buy a home, and may not even um, decide to work in an employed situation that has the predictability um, that other types of employment have, for example, going up ladders 
um, being expected to be happy in management, etc. Functionalists would say it serves an important uh, social structure in helping us stay stratified. Again, this supports the capitalist ideal that there are certain um, types of jobs that are valued more and require more specialization and then there are other jobs that are not. Again, that's being challenged. At what level is the job valued more and why? And the way we live is dependent on work of thousands. Currently in our globalized structure, our commodity chains are so large that we can't even recognize how much we rely on people to get the products and the food and the way of life that we live in. And so um, the functionalists would say that serves us well, it's organic. And yet at the same time, if something like COVID-19 happens, we are very aware of our lack of control. Um, and our inability to recognize that we don't know how to do many of the things for our everyday lives that we rely on others to do for us. Also, work can produce a set of dysfunctions like overwork and job stress. If a market economy requires more of you in hours and focus than institutions of the family and sometimes your own mental health can be put at risk. Also, technology can lead to job wage and losses and we know people go ahead and what Weber would say is that we would rationalize that um, for the greater good, uh, that's just expected for us to not be paid as high because um, that's just the way the economy works. Um, so those different times where we rationalize um, the wage loss, but again, the next perspective uh, would struggle with that in our conflict. Another thing functionalists do is often rely on what's called scientific management, which worked a lot after the Industrial Revolution to convince workers and people to um, buy into the fact that there are different functions of the uh, management system and every organization to work must have that stratified authority where a task and specialization is given to different persons and then valued differently and then the power of management to continually uh, require um, the sense of adherence and uh, obedience from workers who were less specialized. Marx would and fly in the face of this with uh, Das Kapital. Um, his uh, perspective a lot of times is um, sometimes questioned, you know, was he overreactionary? But when it comes to, to understanding labor and how the worker feels um, and is treated, I think he gets it spot on. First of all, uh, Marx would have said uh, that there's a sensuous lost, sensuousness lost in a person being able to make their own products, be able to see right in front of them at least the support of others um, as they make products and being able to recognize um, that whole perspective um, that does not alienate the person, the body, from their own labor and their work. And what capitalism does in its industrialized self uh, is to create a person into a commodity who has a specialized skill that doesn't look at the whole perspective, but instead creates an alienation because a person may be, for example, making a chair, but they're only making the wood chipping that goes into the particle board that goes into the leg of the chair and never really be able to see the final product and therefore create, creates a disconnect. It also then devalues the person because they're only making the wood chips and they're not necessarily making the whole chair. Conflict theorists are, argue that these leaders maintain their power, those who own the bodies of those who are working as their commodities, will often let go those bodies and not consider them uh, as necessary or, as we know, essential. Um, and I see a lot of that going on uh, currently in our um, situation with COVID-19. The feminist perspective would say, that, and I agree with this, all work has a gendered uh, sense to it. Women and men are treated unequally, and there is a division of labor, which Harriet Martineau, who was a sociologist at the time of Marx and Weber, um, brought to light that women 
um, are valued just about the same as a horse. In fact, maybe a horse is valued more um, during her time. And when we recognize again that women's work is something that is uh, differentiated as different and less than, that we really don't have, what does that mean? What is a women's work? And we have created these labels. In fact, um, to the point that if males participate in jobs that were historically deemed to female populations, that they are seen as um, less than. So we have to recognize that we have attached that value. And there's no single occupation currently in the country where everybody that uh, is male and female make exactly the same thing. Um, that it's, males always make more in whatever arena. The interactionist perspective will take our uh, thought processes and sociological imagination into understanding how we've constructed the stereotypes of our work. For example, if you look to the right, um, there's different body presentations of self here, and yet people will often say, you know, if a person has a hippie sign on, they don't work as much, or um, persons with glasses look a certain way or act a certain way. I and mean, there's lots of ways in which we look at something and have been given images. And we do this with our language as well. When we say doctor, um, we sometimes put a particular race or a particular uh, sex or gender to that. When we say nurse, we do the same thing. When we say sometimes teacher, it depends. If we say professor, it depends on what we're doing there, but our brain will sometimes switch back and forth and attach symbolic meaning and value to that. The constructs can serve then as a basis of job discrimination just because we have put this reified expectation of value um, and looking at people symbolically um, differently and valuing them differently. And the persistence of stigma negatively affects, uh, especially, and I don't like this word disabled, um, but affects the differently abled uh, in hiring processes. A lot of times we only see certain ways and shapes and forms of the body as productive. And we need to recognize that um, that is our own construct that we've created. Unemployment and underemployment are something that we're experiencing heavily right now. Um, as brought up last week um, with the video from the TED Talk, um, underemployment is often something young graduates will run into uh, where they've been trained highly for a job but not necessarily get the job uh, that equals their skill level. Also, people who are young, non-college educated and ethnic racial minorities have higher underemployment rates, meaning that um, the discrimination of uh, their status is often um, shut out from higher level jobs and positions um, for lots of um, reasons the conflict theorists would definitely lift up. Unemployment is linked with higher levels of alienation, anxiety, depression, and overall health. Um, and some people choose unemployment over underemployment because they would rather be um, free and, and not uh, put into a box of a place where they're uh, taking themselves out and against their health. But then of course we can only uh, survive so long without a job. But there's a big uh, disconnect there um, when it comes to um, us understanding underemployment and unemployment and the need for both to be looked at more closely. Globalization, <laughs> again, we are all connected now on a globalized commodity chain, but not just their information, communication, how we communicate with others across the globe. So what happens is uh, it can create greater opportunities and we would not have been able to raise economy and the way of life that we live in without the acts of globalization, without um, people being um, uh, able to have jobs tied to other jobs outside the country. One way to say that is that as we've outsourced We've become used to the fact that you can get a job at the Gap or you can get a job <clears throat> at JCPenney and not realize that it is related to the global market. The way globalization works is often creating 
uh, large mass markets that we have relied on and assumed is normal for quite some time. It also keeps us aware um, that when something happens in another part of the world that we are affected by it, and currently we are experiencing that. Um, it's not just about competition. It's also about being able to uh, produce and keep producing so that um, markets can um, be sustained. And that's our current system, whether we agree with it or not, it's our current system. What uh, Wallerstein would say, uh, which is, uh, he's a um, global theorist that talks to us about core countries, semi-peripheral countries and peripheral countries, all being based on this market chain. And when something happens to the core countries, which by the way, the two core countries that are fighting for top power are China and the United States. When something happens to those core countries, it affects the entire global system. And uh, I think we're experiencing that at this time. We also see that a middle class was started to be developed across the globe. It's not just something that has happened in the US. One problem with development and globalization is often after World War II, experts from the United States and European West would go and share with other countries development models that duplicated what the US and the westernized countries did after World War II. Of course, they didn't take into context the different cultures expectations of uh, value of labor and, and all the ways in which those nation states operated and it, it was a mass failure in a lot, large case it caused even more uh, poverty in certain parts of South America and Africa. U.S. manufacturing jobs have also been lost but not only have they been lost they have been redistributed and doesn't mean that U.S. companies haven't still maintained high levels of income at the expense of the US worker losing their job. So that's something to keep in mind with globalization. Minimum wage in 2018 was $7.25. Adjusted with inflation, the current federal minimum wage is less than that between 1961 and 1981. And low wage workers are likely to still be minority, female, non-college educated, non-union, and work in low-end sales and service occupations. And uh, in a book by Barbara Ehrenreich, uh, um, she reported that in order to be able to match her income previously to living on a year of minimum wage, she had to have two jobs or work seven days a week. And um, that, that tells us a lot about what we're doing when we give people a minimum wage. The other thing uh, a sociologist Ulrich Beck would say after World War II, and especially after the creation of the nuclear bomb and also uh, being able to rely on nuclear power, that we have become a world that uh, normalizes the idea of hazardous and stressful being normal. And what we call a high risk society or a risk society that we're basically okay with the time bomb of somebody um, having some sort of a fatal accident or something like, um, you know, a nuclear shutdown of a power plant and it taking out an entire town like Chernobyl. Um, this type of way of life therefore uh, brings to light that illness, injury, job failure, stress involved with that workload, even the possibility of that stress has changed how we do our work. Federal policies that the US Department of Labor uh, often is where we roll these policies through. Um, one of the major ones that has uh, been created in the recent history is the creation of that labor department itself. Um, that's not something that's always been around. And it's about improving our working conditions and opportunities for profitable employment and uh, has served that, especially in the rise of labor unions, that this type of relationship was expected between workers and owners. But there's current debates about this. Um, first of all, the increased minimum wage supporting unions and poverty organizations, uh, supported by unions and poverty organizations, uh, is something that we're seeing break down. The, uh, 
federal systems and even uh, owners uh, are struggling with minimum wage and unions. Also, we've recognized uh, that things like protection against uh, people um, on sexual orientation or discrimination. Uh, for example, uh, in Congress since uh, 1994, we have uh, had every one of our years, um, gosh, I'm losing this right now. <laughs> Basically, ever since 1994, we have introduced non-discrimination against people with any sexual orientation implications, LGBTQAI plus community, and it has not passed. Certain states have higher levels and it's at state level that we see uh, different opportunities and support coming across, but not necessarily every state. So we have to recognize that, for example, living in Kansas, a person who is LGBTQAI has a higher risk given to them than a person who might live in California or New York or other parts of um, the United States. So all of our policies about people, this is also true about women's rights, race and ethnicity, that we are, we are not at a place where equality is happening at any level. And often it's worked out through the state and not the Fed. The living wage movement is meant to be uh, there for um, support of families and workers to be able to live at the cost of living at least or more. There are 38 cities and counties in the United States that have living wage and we're keeping a very close eye on the happiness component of those communities. And we are also uh, recognizing that many people claim that the wages living will hurt local economy, but we have not studied places that have had living wages um, long enough to see whether that's really true. Um, paying more doesn't necessarily mean that people won't put that back into the economy themselves. So uh, again, Obama endorsed a $10.10 minimum wage, but that did not come through and it was not uh, ratified. Organized uh, labor unions has been a part of my life for a long time. My dad was a team, teamster. I think that this has been one of our biggest areas of contention. Labor unions serve to bargain. And when you consider Marx, he would say, you know, if that voice goes away, then you don't have the ability to fight for yourself as a person. Um, many workers protections initially advocated by unions are now federal and state laws. And we know that happened with discussion and um, with hard work sometimes even to the point of picketing and um, being able to uh, make sure that every person has representation, not just from um, the management, but from their own uh, collective organization. That's it for this week. Sorry at the end, I got a little bit tired. Uh, it's been a couple uh, tough weeks, but I uh, look forward to our um, next week's conversations and also the leadership as we talk more about work and the economy and the world we're living in. Have a good week.